Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and the mercy and blessings of God be with you all. Thank you for joining me for this live post. I begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, and all of the righteous people of all time. I ask God to bless you all from around the globe as you join me here for this live post. And uh, I pray that this will be an informative and educational uh, post. Uh, I will speak about the Holy Spirit and uh, hit, uh, the, the appearance of the Holy Spirit in the Synoptic Gospels in particular. Uh, this being part of a longer series in which uh, I will trace uh, the uh, development of the idea uh, that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. <clears throat> so today, the Synoptic Gospels. I'm your brother in faith, uh, Shabir Ali. Thank you for joining me. So, Synoptic Gospels refer to Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke. These three Gospels in particular, out of the four which are in the Bible, they're called Synoptic Gospels because they can be seen together. We can see in parallel columns uh, that uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, have basically the same stories and the same general outline of events. Now, of course, Matthew and, Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke depart from uh, Mark in uh, many things. Uh, and uh, but when uh, when they do come together, Matthew and Luke, it is found that Mark is the third um, element uh, in in the mix, uh, and so he that Mark becomes the common uh, factor uh, between them. And uh, scholars have, uh, based on this and other observations, decided uh, that uh, the there is uh, what is called a synoptic relationship between these three gospels. Uh, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, owe themselves to a literary origin, and that literary origin seems to be in Mark's Gospel. So uh, Matthew and uh, Luke were uh, copying from Mark's Gospel, but not uh, slavishly copying. They were copying with modifications. They looked at some things. They didn't feel that's it right, that's it's right and so uh, they uh, gave their own rendering. Uh, of those uh, events. So we see this uh, most clearly in uh, what is referred to as the Gospel Parallels uh, by Barton Throckmorton. This is a listing of uh, the pericopes in each of the Gospels, and they are lined side by side. So Matthew, Mark in the middle, and then Luke on the other side. And uh, we can see uh, by comparison going across that uh, Mark is in the middle, Mark says something one way, and then Matthew puts it another way, and then Luke puts it uh, another way. Uh, sometimes only Matthew and Luke are together, and uh, <clears throat> when that happens, especially when they are quoting a saying of Jesus, uh, this is noted to have come from what scholars refer to as the Q Gospel. Uh, that is uh, a gospel that w consisted mainly of sayings of Jesus, very few uh, mention of events, and uh, in, in that uh, gospel, which circulated probably 20 years before Mark was written, uh, we, we have uh, some more primitive ideas about uh, Christianity and what it entails. Some of these sayings were picked up by Matthew and Luke uh, separately. And uh, where Matthew and Luke are together with these sayings, we can see uh, where perhaps a, a modification has been made either by Matthew or by uh, Luke. And um, we can see, therefore, the proclivities uh, of the individual uh, gospel writers by following this kind of trajectory. Now, coming to our topic of the Holy Spirit, we find uh, many interesting points. First, uh, if we look at Mark's Gospel, which is the earliest of the four that we have in the New Testament, we find very little uh, mention of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. I have here with me uh, Young's Analytical Concordance um, to the Bible. And we can see here, this is Young's Analytical Concordance to the Bible. And um, uh, we can see here, you know, in very fine print, a listing of uh, the occurrences where a word occurs. So if we look up Holy, if we look up Spirit here, then we can see all the places in the Bible, Old and New Testament, where the word Spirit occurs. And then we can see in Mark's uh, Gospel, there's very little mention uh, of the Spirit. Um, we have that the Spirit uh, descended on Jesus like a dove, um, but that's not very much different from the Old Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Spirit sometimes comes down uh, on, a, on a person. Here, the description, like a dove, this is unique, true, but it doesn't 
um, show that the Holy Spirit is uh, the third person of the divine uh, trinity. And um, then it says that the, uh, the Spirit uh, drove uh, Jesus into the wilderness, drove him into the wilderness. So here, this is one of the instances where when we compare across to Matthew and Luke, we see that Matthew and Luke have modified it. Apparently, they didn't like the idea that the Holy Spirit drives Jesus. Uh, so they they have it that uh, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert. But Mark is very clear. Uh, the Spirit drives Jesus into the desert. Now, um, so there's a lot about unclean spirits. Um, and then uh, Mark chapter 2, verse number 8, Jesus perceived in his spirit. So in his spirit. That there is no uh, attempt here to distinguish between the Holy Spirit and uh, Jesus. And Jesus perceived in his spirit. It's almost like, uh, you know, speaking of a man uh, thinking within himself. Um, and um, um, so I'm still looking for uh, more places in Mark's gospel where it says uh, something about spirit. Uh, chapter 8, verse number 12. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, uh, and uh, so Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit again. It's like, you know, he's thinking within himself. He's internally, he's groaning or whatever. Uh, but it doesn't uh, give the impression that there is another um, divine person who is called uh, the Spirit. And um, it, it, that, that's about it, really, for, for, the, for the Holy Spirit in, in Mark's Gospel. Uh, so you can see that Mark took the pains to write a Gospel. Obviously, he's teaching uh, the elements of the Christian belief to his readers. And um, he doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit being a, a divine uh, a person in the Trinity. Um, so how could that be? It must be that this is a later and developing belief. So we will see how Matthew and Luke, in each in their own ways, uh, try to develop that belief a little bit further. Not that they have the end in view, because uh, the, the end is not there in view yet. The end will be developed uh, over the remaining centuries. Uh, but uh, the, for, for Matthew and Luke, they feel some discomfort with the way in which Mark leaves things, and uh, they improve it a little bit uh, along the way. So uh, Matthew um, says that Jesus saw the Spirit of God descending. So at the baptism scene where Jesus is there, and uh, Mark tells us the story from, the, from, from a neutral point of view. Um, but uh, now Matthew is telling the story from Jesus' point of view. Jesus saw the Spirit. So if we ask from Mark's Gospel, okay, so the Spirit descended. How does anyone know that this was the Spirit that descended? Well, uh, because it's being told from a neutral point of view, the Spirit descended. So we, uh, we want to know uh, from Mark then, okay, well, how do you know that this was the Spirit of God? Well, Matthew uh, puts it that Jesus saw the Spirit. Uh, Jesus saw heavens uh, opened. Uh, so it's now from the point of view of Jesus. So you might now assume that uh, Jesus must have told his disciples that he saw the Spirit on that occasion, and uh, hence it can be written down as a factual event that uh, the Spirit was seen on that occasion. Who saw him? Jesus uh, saw him. Jesus saw the Spirit. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, Jesus was led up in, uh, of the Spirit. Uh, that's in chapter 4, verse number 1. And um, uh, but uh, in the rest of the gospel, we don't find, though, that there's anything that clearly indicates that the Spirit is, um, is something so um, unique and, and um, uh, as a part of the divine trinity. Um, so he says, for example, blessed are the poor in spirit. So that means um, people um, have spirits. And uh, what is meant by poor in spirit uh, is as opposed to just simply being poor, is not exactly clear to me, but you can see how the word spirit is being used. Again, a lot about casting out unclean spirits. Then in, Mar in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 20, uh, Matthew uh, has Jesus speaking about uh, uh, what will happen to his disciples after him. They will be persecuted, and uh, when they have to give evidence, uh, they should not worry about what they're going to say, because it is the spirit of your father which speaks uh, in you. So it, the spirit of your father, 
So here, there is no designation, the Holy Spirit, uh, as a separate designation uh, that will speak uh, for you or through you or whatever. It is the, the spirit of your father. And uh, just as we wouldn't say, you know, my spirit is something separate and distinct from me, uh, then the spirit of your father does not seem to be, on, on first blush, uh, something different uh, and distinct from the father himself. Uh, so uh, in uh, chapter 12, verse number 18, Jesus uh, is uh, shown to be the servant uh, of God that was spoken about uh, in Isaiah chapter 42. And there, as uh, it is quoted again here, uh, God said, I will put my spirit upon him. Uh, but that is, again, just like the Old Testament prophets, the spirit of God came upon them. And uh, this, too, is not an indication that um, the Holy Spirit is a third person of the divine trinity. Um, and then, again, there's more about unclean spirits in one case, seven. Uh, in in Mark, Matthew chapter 22, verse number 43, there's a reference to David uh, speaking... Um, now, how can uh, how then uh, doth David in spirit does David in spirit call him? So, so David was speaking in the spirit. That means in the Psalms, uh, the, when David is speaking, David is uh, led by the Holy Spirit. So that again is the way in which we understand the Old Testament prophets uh, to be working. And that's uh, that's about it in, in in Matthew's Gospel. We'll come back to the one saying. Uh, where Jesus says, uh, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, uh, it will not be forgiven of him. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, uh, we have much more about the Holy Spirit. So we can see Mark has a little bit, Matthew has more, uh, Luke has even more. Uh, so in Luke, uh, not only is Jesus filled with the Spirit, but uh, others uh, around him too, are, are, are especially before him, are filled with the Spirit. So uh, it is prophesied uh, that before Jesus is born, he shall uh, go before God uh, in the spirit, in the spirit. So what is meant by that is not clear. Um, uh, and then uh, figures uh, who are given the news about Jesus, they are, are delighting. My, uh, one, uh, Luke one forty seven. my spirit had rejoiced in God, my savior. Uh, so my spirit, that's the human person's uh, spirit. The child grew, Luke says in one, uh, chapter 1, verse 80, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. In spirit. Waxed strong in spirit. Uh, so what is meant by in spirit as, just, as, to, uh, as opposed to just simply waxing strong? This is not entirely clear to me. Uh, Luke 2.27, and he came by the spirit into the temple. He came by the spirit. So came by the Spirit. Again, we have no clear indication that the Spirit is anything other than a, a, a force of God working uh, on the earth uh, in this particular case. Uh, Luke 2.40, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. The child waxed strong in spirit. What is meant by waxed strong in spirit as, to, uh, as opposed to just simply waxed strong? Um, again, not clear to me, but I don't see any indication here. Uh, of the Trinitarian belief. And then, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So he returned in the power of the Spirit. Again, we have it just as the Spirit took him into the desert, it looks like the Spirit is bringing him back. And that Spirit is a power um, that, uh, given the Old Testament and what we explained in my last uh, post last week, uh, this um, obviously is the power of God working uh, and uh, making changes in the world. Uh, 4.18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says. But here he's quoting Isaiah chapter 61, and that is speaking about a prophet. And uh, Jesus is uh, here showing himself to be a prophet. And as prophets in the past, he too has the Spirit of God upon him. Um, no indication of a Trinitarian belief here. And then there are people, you know, with unclean spirits, um, and um, um, uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 39, again about uh, unclean spirits. Jesus rebukes the unclean spirits. Um, okay, ch ch chapter 10, verse number 21, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. So what does it mean he rejoiced in the spirit? So again, not very clear, uh, but no Trinitarian belief is evident here. 
Um, now, in, in Luke chapter 11, verse number 13, uh, Jesus uh, uh, tells people to pray and ask God for what they need, uh, because God will give them um, what, what, what they're asking for. Because he says that even if you uh, give your children uh, things when they ask for it, then how much more uh, the Father will give you the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, Matthew's parallel um, shows that uh, the wording is, how much more would the Father give good things to those who ask him? So uh, what did Jesus actually say? Did he say uh, that uh, the Father will give good things to those who ask him? Uh, or did he say that the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Uh, scholars generally reconcile these two passages by saying, that Matthew seems to have the original wording here, that the Father will give good things to those who ask him. And it is Luke, with his proclivity to insert the Holy Spirit, who has changed this to Holy Spirit. So then, uh, if we're trying to ask, uh, what did Jesus uh, think about the Holy Spirit? Did Jesus think that the Holy Spirit is a, an individual uh, person within uh, divinity, separate and distinct from the Father? Then the, this verse is not going to prove Jesus believing that. Uh, this is more uh, an indication of Luke's uh, proclivity uh, on this uh, question. Uh, so, um, and then when Jesus was on the cross uh, and, and he's about to die, he uh, says uh, in uh, 23, verse number 46, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Uh, so, uh, that means Jesus has a spirit, and he's commending that into the hands of the Father. To all appearances, this is a human spirit. Jesus' human spirit is being commended into the hands of the Father. Uh, so there's no indication here of a Trinitarian belief. And uh, eventually, when uh, Jesus reappears to his disciples after he had resurrected from the dead, uh, they supposed that they had seen a spirit. Uh, but Jesus uh, assured them that uh, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as they see that he has. So in a way here, he is uh, denying uh, that he is a spirit. If one want, wanted to be very technical, one, would, uh, one might suppose that he's not denying that he's a spirit. Uh, he is just uh, maybe saying he's not a mere spirit because they supposed that he's a mere spirit. And Jesus is trying to show them that He's not a mere spirit. He has also flesh and, uh, and bone. So whatever the interpretation of that, we see then that that's about the sum total of the uh, Synoptic Gospels presentation of the Holy Spirit, except for one thing, which I said I'll come back to. So uh, Jesus is uh, reported to have said in the Synoptic Gospels uh, that uh, whoever blasphemes uh, against the Son, it will be forgiven him. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, uh, it will not be forgiven him. So uh, why, why this distinction about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? Well, uh, given my explanation last week that uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit is a way uh, of speaking about God's activity in the world, uh, so um, uh, then blaspheming against the Holy Spirit uh, would, uh, would be blaspheming against the God himself. Uh, so uh, we have to see what, uh, what is the mention of the Holy Spirit in what particular context and uh, be aware that it could mean different things in different contexts. So in this uh, particular um, context, uh, it is obvious that uh, Jesus uh, was doing uh, miraculous works uh, by uh, the Spirit of God, given the biblical uh, presentation. The Quranic presentation is slightly different in that it says that uh, Allah... God aided Jesus with a spirit from himself. Uh, so uh, that, uh, but, but that's, that's not the statement in the Quran. The Quran has a different uh, sort of statement. Whoever is an enemy, enemy of Gabriel uh, should know that uh, he's the one who reveals uh, the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, so, the, you know, you don't want to be at enmity with, with Gabriel. So that's the Quranic context. But in the uh, biblical context here, uh, Jesus is uh, doing miraculous works by the Holy Spirit. And the people are saying, no, you're doing th that by an evil spirit. So they're calling the spirit evil, uh, whereas, of course, this is uh, the spirit of God. And, and so this is uh, blasphemy against God himself. And, and that is the best explanation for why 
uh, it would be unforgivable to uh, blaspheme against the Holy uh, Spirit, whereas it is not unforgivable to blaspheme against the Son. And if the Son and the Holy Spirit were, were equal, uh, co-equal um, as uh, divine persons, then of course uh, the sin against uh, each of them would be equal. Uh, but in this case, we see that, uh, as the saying goes, uh, to blaspheme against the Son, this is forgivable. To blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, unforgivable. Uh, at the same time, we see that Luke has his own uh, special way of rendering uh, a, a comparable passage here with Matthew. So Matthew says that he, uh, Jesus is uh, casting out um, uh, evil spirits by the Holy Spirit. Whereas uh, Luke says that Jesus was casting out uh, the devils by the finger of God. So if we match the two, one would have to say that uh, the finger of God is Luke's way of speaking about the Holy Spirit in this uh, occasion. Um, if, if we're to just match the two uh, without the question of uh, where, where this is being de developed towards. Uh, so in, in short, uh, we, we do not have anything in the Synoptic Gospels that indicates anything more than that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is a divine force, a power uh, of God that is working in the world, enacting changes, uh, inspiring persons, leading persons to act and to speak. And um, the divine, uh, this, uh, this divine power uh, is, uh, is not an independent uh, um, person. Uh, deep, uh, independent from the Father, so that one could say that the uh, Trinity is uh, comprised of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and these three are co-equal and co-eternal with God. When we come to uh, other, God, we'll come to the fourth gospel eventually. Uh, before that, I want to look at Acts of the Apostles. So next week, uh, God willing, uh, I will look at uh, the presentation of the Holy Spirit in Acts of the Apostles. This is um, uh, Luke's continuation. Uh, of his gospel. So just as we have seen that there is uh, an, a, a, a larger emphasis on the Holy Spirit in Luke's gospel, we will see that this emphasis continues into the Acts of the Apostles, uh, tracing the history of the earliest Christians for about 30 years after Jesus had left the scene. We will look at developments there, and we will look eventually at the fourth gospel as well to see what developments are in the fourth gospel regarding the Holy Spirit, and especially uh, the paraclete, who is said in John's Gospel to be the Holy Spirit. And uh, we will examine all of that in great uh, detail. And we will look at Paul's presentation of the Holy Spirit as well. And uh, we will uh, try in this way uh, to take it step by step and look at uh, the development of the idea of the Holy Spirit uh, through uh, the earliest decades of Christianity and also uh, eventually the earliest centuries of Christianity leading up to uh, the Nicene Creed and eventually the niceno constantinopolitan Creed when eventually the Holy Spirit was declared to be worthy of uh, worship along with uh, the Father and the Son. So I'm going to leave these uh, thoughts with you. Uh, there may be something more to mention. Perhaps I missed a verse that mentions the Holy Spirit in the Synoptic Gospels and you would like to and get clarity on that, um, uh, perhaps to ask me why did I miss that verse, uh, if indeed there is such a verse. Uh, so do share with me your thoughts, your ideas, and uh, your questions. Uh, I will now uh, look uh, at your um, comments and uh, responses. So, uh, Shahrukh uh, Siddiqui, I'm going to straighten the camera there a little bit. Okay, Shahrukh uh, Siddiqui. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. David heals. May Allah give you long life. Thank you, Brother David, for these du'as. Uh, I thrive on such du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and, um, and all, around, uh, all of those around you. Uh, Qadir Hussain, Assalamu alaikum, watching from Trinidad. MashaAllah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all of the people of Trinidad. Uh, Radi Zwani, dear Brother Shabir, could you please inform us of the various ways to interact with Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, greetings from the ne Netherlands. Uh, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you uh, from, uh, and all of the people in the Netherlands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all, save you all from the COVID-19 and from every other disease and sickness and distress and uh, stress. So how do we re interact with Jehovah's Witnesses? Uh, well, uh, we have some Jehovah's Witnesses who from time to time join us in this uh, forum. 
so I don't want to say anything that uh, may sound offensive to anyone. I, uh, I do apologize in advance if um, if I do uh, slip in this in this regard. Um, but uh, just to answer your question, uh, many years ago I was uh, studying Jehovah's Witnesses partly because uh, some came knocking on my door trying to convince me to become a Jehovah's Witness, and. Um, uh, so I started collecting their materials and studying them. Some other people realized uh, that I'm interested in this. They also brought me some materials. And um, last week in my presentation, I referred to Insight on the Scriptures, that green book I was showing, which is a two-volume encyclopedia of useful entries uh, on various uh, aspects of uh, belief uh, relating to the Bible. Um, so with this uh, insight in mind, I had uh, prepared some short messages, which eventually I compiled into a book entitled Questions to Ask uh, Visiting Jehovah's Witnesses. So if you can get a copy of that, uh, maybe it's available on the web somewhere, or uh, write to us uh, for a copy. Go to my website, uh, uh, shabirali.com, or uh, our, organization's, uh, our, our, our organization's website, uh, www.islaminfo.com. So uh, go there, um, uh, and you can make a request uh, to get a copy of this book. We'll be glad to send you a copy. Um, so, um, uh, in general, be aware that Jehovah's Witnesses, are like us, do not uh, believe in the Trinity. They believe that uh, there is only one God. And uh, though they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they don't take him to be the Almighty God. They take him to be a mighty God, though. And, uh, of course, in this, they differ from Muslims. Uh, but they, they do not accept the Trinity, they do not accept that Jesus is uh, the ultimate God, and um, uh, they, they have uh, thus uh, a closer um, a belief uh, to that of Muslims than Trinitarians uh, do. Okay, Bobby, um, Dr. Ali, how, uh, what method do you use when you read the Bible, and is it the same method uh, you use when you read the Quran and authentic Hadith? Um, well, yes and no. So uh, I approach both the Quran and the Bible uh, as, uh, as an academic. I, you know, I, when I studied at the University of Toronto, University of Toronto is a secular institution, so you cannot come there with your prior beliefs. You cannot come and say, okay, I believe the Quran is the Word of God, and based on my belief that the Quran is the Word of God, I think it must mean this. Uh, no, we, there we have to take the Quran and the Hadith uh, as uh, we would uh, view any other literature, and uh, we would look at the history and uh, um, evidence of its early compilation and uh, existence and, and what it must have meant to the people at the time, given the nature of the language. We have to comb uh, dictionaries, uh, the most ancient we can find, or clues to what this word might have meant at the time when it was uh, first uh, mentioned in the Quran and so on. So we have to uh, approach everything from a secular, historical, critical uh, perspective. So too with the Bible. Uh, so when we approach the Bible um, in that uh, academic setting, we're going to bring the same uh, rules of inquiry uh, into play there. Now, of course, uh, outside of the academic setting, and uh, naturally I am a, a, a person of faith in the Quran, and in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So when I approach the Quran, when I approach the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I will approach with a certain degree of reverence, and I will be interpreting that for the Muslim community from the perspective of this is the, what we share, this is the common belief that we have. Now, I don't have that advantage with the, with the Bible. Sometimes I try. I try to examine the Bible from the point of view of uh, Christians who believe in it, but uh, try as I may, I, I won't be able to because everybody comes with his or her own biases, so we should admit that. Uh, I have a bias, and uh, my bias is that I'm a Muslim, so when I approach the Bible, uh, Christians should not expect that they're going to hear like a Christian presentation of what the Bible means. At the same time, both Christians and Muslims have uh, the same sort of academic interest in the Bible that I talked about. So Christians may join us on this forum, and Christians come with the belief that the Bible uh, teaches the Trinity. Fine. Um, and now they come and they hear me saying the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. Well, uh, now it, what remains is uh, the evaluation. Okay, so what's the evidence that, that the Bible teaches the Trinity? This does not believe uh, depend on a person's prior belief. Uh, Christians, uh, if I was in a debate with a Christian friend and the Christian friend believes that the Bible teaches the Trinity, 
then uh, he cannot start with that belief because that's the very thing that needs to be proven. So you'd have to start from a neutral point, point of view. I myself, when I approach the, the Bible, I have to approach it from that neutral point of view uh, as uh, a student inquiring and trying to understand where do Christians uh, find that the Trinity is mentioned. So taking the Holy Spirit in particular, where, where do our Christian friends find it mentioned? And now looking at it from the historical point of view, what is the earliest mention of this? So as we are exploring the, the, the question of the Holy Spirit now, I'm taking that historical um, method and asking, okay, what's the earliest mention of this? So um, we can take the same thing about uh, the Hadith, and in fact I do. Uh, if something is mentioned in Hadith, I want to know what's the earliest mention of this? What's the earliest Hadith about this? We line up the books of Hadith. Uh, so there's Bukhari and Muslim and uh, Tirmidhi and Abu Dawud and Nasai, Ibn Majah. Ibn Majah is uh, not only late in the game, but Ibn Majah uh, actually has some Hadiths which Muslim scholars have identified as uh, being very weak and perhaps even spurious. Uh, so how do we know this? We compare those with the hadiths which were written even before him and using more stringent measures of uh, authenticity. So in a similar way, when we approach the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as I've done today, uh, we are looking at uh, which is the earliest of the four and, um, and, and uh, you know, how stringent uh, was the measures in preserving the words of Jesus in these various Gospels. So we saw uh, that uh, the Gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when lined up against each other, uh, or side by side with each other, we see that Mark, uh, the most primitive, uh, has very little to say about the Holy Spirit. Matthew has a little bit more. Luke has even more still. And um, uh, I should have mentioned as well that uh, one of the differences, uh, this is not so much an answer to this question, um, uh, Bobby, but um, this is an important uh, addition. Uh, perhaps somebody already has mentioned this in the comments, um, and, and I'll come to the, your, the rest of your comments uh, in a moment. But this is an important part that should have been included in my main presentation. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we have the birth narrative. Mark does not have the birth narrative. Uh, and in the birth narrative, we find in both Matthew and Luke that uh, the, the, the father of, of Jesus will be the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is by implication or even by explicit attribution. In, in, in Matthew's gospel, when um, the message is given to Joseph about the birth of his son, uh, the message is given in, in words which imply that uh, the, um, the Holy Spirit, uh, like that which is conceived in, in Mary, is of the Holy Spirit, which means, uh, uh, as uh, Simon Gathercole, uh, I think, is the one who put it this way, uh, that it means uh, that uh, the, the Holy Spirit is, in a way, like the father of, uh, of Jesus. He's taken the place of, of the male element in, in the relationship. Uh, what would have been the father? This has become now the Holy Spirit. And something like this seems to be hinted in, in Luke's gospel as well, where it says that the Spirit uh, will uh, come upon you, upon Mary. And, um, you know, so that which is uh, born will, that holy thing which is in you will be the Son of God. So um, if, if the Holy Spirit is a separate and distinct person from uh, the Father, then it would mean that uh, Jesus has basically two fathers. It would mean the Father is the Father, naturally, and uh, the Holy Spirit is also the Father of Jesus, so he would have two fathers. But nobody says that. And um, um, I just wanted to add that in because I just recall that uh, that would have been an important part of uh, my presentation of the Holy Spirit in the Synoptic Gospels to give you a rounded uh, picture of everything that seems to be mentioned in these uh, Synoptic Gospels. But back to your question, uh, Bobby. So yes, uh, I, you know, I, I use similar methods uh, depending on, on what I'm trying to achieve at, at the moment. Uh, if I was, uh, you know, uh, called to preach uh, the, the Christian Gospel in a church, sometimes they, they do that. Sometimes, uh, you know, they, I'm invited to go and, and preach uh, in a church uh, if I, you know, as part of the usual Sunday uh, sermon. So if I'm invited to go preach in a church, uh, I'm not going to take any of these um, critical um, elements with me. I'm not going to go uh, tell people in the church, no, you can't believe in your in your gospels. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, um, or that their belief in the Trinity is wrong. Uh, I may be invited, you know, with very limited um, 
uh, scope in, in what I'm supposed to do when I'm there. Um, so with that limited scope, I have to respect, um, you know, the environment in which I am. I, I have to um, give a message that is common to Islam and Christianity, but I'll base that uh, on, on the Bible. If I'm to speak about death, I may, you know, add some elements from Islam if that's what is expected of me, and usually it will be expected of me. But I will cite passages from the Bible, um, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament about death, because here we're speaking a common message to uh, Christians and, and Muslims. So in that context, I wouldn't bring any critical uh, studies, nothing about this historical critical method. Um, but uh, if, if I'm called into a dialogue in which we are exploring differences and similarities, well, then all of these critical elements can come into play depending on the scope uh, of, the, of the dialogue and what is allowable uh, in that particular dialogue. People set the rules in advance. Sometimes they say, okay, let's just get together and talk. You just speak about your own religion. We'll speak about our own religion, but don't comment upon the other person's uh, religion. So all of that. So in this forum, because uh, I have the full scope, uh, I'm t speaking my mind, I have the opportunity and the responsibility uh, to speak clearly about uh, what I understand about the, the historical development of the doctrine that I'm speaking about. And uh, I hope that uh, our Christian friends will respect that. Okay, so Rahma, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you blessings. I'm your Rabb, and thank you, uh, Sister Rahma, or uh, brother. Sometimes I don't know from the name if it's a brother or a sister. Sometimes I can't see the image either. Um, uh, that, that would indicate whether it's a male or female. So please forgive me if I mispronounce your names, if I mispronounce or I misidentify you in terms of gender. Okay, so uh, Farhan, um, assalamu alaikum from Bahrain, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you, Rabbi Farhan, uh, wa alaikum assalam. May Allah protect all of the people of Bahrain and uh, give you every good. I don't know how quickly the vaccines are being rolled out in your country. Uh, here in Ontario, it's a little bit slow. The rest of Canada is a little bit faster than Ontario, but we hope that this will pick up soon as well. Soon, soon inshallah, we'll all be vaccinated and we will feel more comf confident uh, in uh, going about and meeting people. I, inshallah, eventually will be traveling again. Uh, perhaps I'll come to some of the countries uh, that you represent. Okay, Ahmed Abu Bakr, uh, Abu Kar. Um, uh, mashallah, uh, Dr. Uh, Sheikh, may, may Allah give you longer life, inshallah. Thank you, Brother Ahmed. Jazakum al khairan. May Allah bless you as well with long life and good health and uh, all uh, of those who are around you. Chris Chase, my good friend. Salam alaikum, blessings and good morning to you all. Uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, wa alaikum as salam, and uh, blessings and good morning to you as well. Well, it's now afternoon, actually, um, since I started. Okay, so good afternoon to you, Chris, and uh, may God uh, be with you and bless you and all of those around you. Bobby, uh, if I use this level of hyper-skepticism when reading the Quran as you do the Bible, would you agree we can make multiple cases that will create doubt uh, uh, with regards to the Quran being a revelation from God through Gabriel? Well, you know, Bob, Bobby, this is being done. I mean, um, non-Muslims and uh, even some Muslims may be uh, using some uh, critical methods to examine the Quran. So uh, this, this is being done. And... Um, now, I'm not saying that you can't do it, uh, but then in the end, these are the issues that we debate over. Uh, you know, if we have a debate, uh, the Muslim will be presenting his case, why he believes the Quran to be the word of God, and the non-Muslim will be using the hyper-skeptical method to um, um, present what, you know, they feel uh, to be reasons for not believing the Quran to be the word of God. And then, um, you know, the Muslim will come back to question those hypercritical methods. Uh, let me just uh, say here that uh, the, the methods that I've used, uh, Bobby, with regards to the uh, New Testament and studying it so carefully as I've done here, uh, is not uh, hypercritical. Hypercritical would be like those people who uh, question whether Jesus existed at all. But it has become um, uh, now commonplace. Maybe at one time people viewed this to be hypercritical. But uh, now it has become very commonplace among Christian scholarship for, uh, for scholars to say uh, that uh, Matthew and Luke were uh, copied from Mark. You know, you will find this in the introduction to Bibles, for example. This is a Bible here. Um, it's a Catholic Bible, New American Bible. Uh, so you will find here that uh, in the introduction, this is very clear. This is the method that they're using in analyzing uh, the Gospels of Matthew and, and Luke. Uh, they, they, they take that as for granted that uh, Matthew and Luke uh, were using Mark, and that they also used a source called Q. 
And uh, in order to trace the history, this is what Christian scholars generally do. I'm not making this up as a Muslim. In fact, I didn't discover all of these things. I'm, I'm reading the books by Christian scholars who are already describing these things. And they're not describing these things to attack or to dismantle the Bible. No, they themselves are uh, serious as historians and academics. Uh, they want to get back to the roots of things. They want to find out uh, how did the idea of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Holy Trinity emerge? How did it develop? Uh, who was the first, first person to say what about the Holy Spirit and so on? So the ideas are being traced like this. I haven't done anything that um, is inimical uh, to the Bible here. It may sound like that because obviously I'm using the same scholarship uh, to, uh, to uh, emphasize a certain conclusion that, that the, you know, the Spirit is, uh, was not uh, conceived of at this time to be the third person of the Holy Trinity, whereas uh, the Christian scholars may just mention that once and in passing and off they go. They're just dealing with the historical material and they're leaving the conclusion to their uh, faithful and not perhaps wanting to ruffle any feathers or to um, <clears throat> cause the Christian faithful to um, you know, be scandalized or anything like that. Uh, but, but those are the facts. So, um, and, and they're not facts that are presented by people who are inimical to the faith. It, it is actually uh, mainstream scholarship. So uh, the average Christian may not be aware of this mainstream scholarship. And uh, Dennis Nineham complained about this many decades ago, uh, ago in his uh, commentary on Mark's gospel in the Pelican New Testament commentaries. He just spoke about the wide gap that remains between uh, the uh, scholars of the faith and the person in the pew. And uh, no one is doing much to enlighten the person in the pew. Um, so I hope that perhaps this presentation will help some who, who bother to, to join us. Okay, so Khalid Johannes, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh from Ethiopia, mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all of the people of Ethiopia, may Allah protect you all from COVID-19 and from every other sickness and disease and stress and distress. And um, Dennis was replying to Bobby, so I'll skip the reply. I'll deal with what is addressed to me um, specifically. <clears throat> given the limited time that we have. Okay, Corey. Uh, Dr. Shabir, salam alaikum. Could you comment on the concept of Jesus, peace be upon him, having the title Ruh Allah, and how this might be related to him being strengthened with the Ruh Al-Qudus? So uh, this uh, now gets into an area, um, uh, Corey, that is not entirely clear to Muslims. We only have some vague indications about the spirit in general. The Quran says, yes, aluna kanya ruh. They ask you about the spirit. Say the spirit is by the command of my Lord or, or from the affairs of my Lord. Whereas you have not been given of knowledge except a little. Uh, so we, we don't have that much knowledge about the spirit or spirit, uh, things regarding the spirit. But the Quran says that uh, it, it, Jesus is ruhum min. Jesus is a spirit from God. A spirit. Now, it doesn't say that uh, he is the spirit as if there is only one, uh, but uh, and even if that expression is used, uh, the spirit, uh, then it doesn't necessarily mean one. So sometimes we speak about the king. It doesn't mean that he's the only king ever. It means that within a certain context, uh, he, you know, he is the king. Or sometimes we say the man. Uh, so, we, we, you know, the man is here. It means that we were expecting a certain man, and uh, now he's here. He is the man that we were expecting, but we just say the man. And the use of the definite article doesn't mean that he is the only one. And so, um, speaking of uh, Jesus as Ruh, al uh, Ruh Allah, uh, the Spirit of God, it doesn't mean that he is the only Spirit of God. Muslim commentators explain this by saying that we are all, in some way, um, Spirit from God, because uh, when we are in the wombs of our mothers, according to a hadith, uh, the Spirit is blown into uh, the embryo. Uh, so we, are, we become like spiritual beings. And as I said, this is mysterious. We, we don't claim to know everything about this, but at least we know that this does not mean that Jesus is God. As for the Ruh al-Qudus, uh, uh, the spirit of holiness uh, being uh, at Jesus' aid, well, that uh, is uh, mentioned in, with regards to believers in general as well. God is going to help them with the spirit from him. Uh, so that's the believers in general. Uh, so it's not uh, Jesus specifically, but Jesus gets this um, a specific mention because perhaps uh, with him it was such an outstanding feature uh, of his uh, ministry. 
and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows uh, best regarding that. Okay, uh, so Samir Buyan, uh, Assalamu alaikum, I heard some Christian debates, uh, debaters use Yahweh uh, to refer to Jesus. Why don't they use Yahweh to refer to the Holy Spirit or the Father? I love from Bangladesh, love you. Wa alaikum as brother uh, Samir, and uh, I love you as well, and all of the people of Bangladesh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, protect you all, save you from COVID-19, and from every other uh, calamity and uh, source of uh, discomfort. So, uh, yeah, this is an important question. Uh, sometimes, um, uh, generally, they only refer, they, they only use Yahweh to refer to the Father, or to God in a vague way. Um, but when we press them in, in debate and we say, okay, well, you know, wait a minute, uh, you, you know, if there's only one God and he's called Yahweh, as the Old Testament insists, and you say that Jesus is God, for him to be God, he has to be Yahweh. And then they say, yeah, he's Yahweh as well. And then we say, okay, but then that would mean the Holy Spirit as well. And then they will say, yes, the Holy Spirit as well. But you're right, they don't go around referring to the Holy Spirit as Yahweh. Uh, nor do they generally go about referring to Jesus as, uh, as Yahweh, and especially so, not the Holy Spirit. Um, so it, it seems that there is something lacking there in their thought. They don't have the pieces all together, and in debate, uh, th this is what they're uh, driven to say. And now I'll, I'll look at this same problem from a flip side. Now, the Holy Spirit is obviously a spirit, and the Bible says that there is only one spirit. And... Um, now, uh, we read in the Bible as well about the Spirit of Jesus. We'll see this more next week when we look at Acts of the Apostles. So Jesus has a spirit. And um, um, Paul, when we see Paul's writings, Paul says the Lord is the spirit. And it seems there that the Lord, by the Lord, he means Jesus. So the Jesus is the spirit. So that would mean that he is what spirit. Um, and since there's only one spirit, he would have to be that spirit. And, and, and this comes in, or brings into view all kinds of difficulties because uh, from the Trinitarian point of view, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. You cannot say that the Father is the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit is the Son or the Son is the Father. Uh, any one of these statements would, um, would, would amount to blasphemy or, or a heretical, heretical uh, belief. And yet, um, we have Paul saying the Lord is the Spirit, so this is problematic. But more to the point, uh, since Jesus is a Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is uh, by definition a Spirit, and uh, where in John's Gospel it says God is Spirit, then obviously Christians would take that to mean that the Father is also Spirit. So, uh, if the Father is a Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a Spirit, and Jesus is a Spirit, then you would have three Spirits, and yet the Bible says there is only one Spirit. Uh, so, if there are three spirits, then why call only one the Holy Spirit? Like, why don't you call the Father the Holy Spirit? And, you know, call them Holy Spirits. Holy Spirits 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Holy Spirit number 1, uh, Holy Spirit number 1, Holy Spirit number 2, Holy Spirit number 3. If you don't want to say, uh, speak of them in, a, in an orderly uh, fashion to indicate some kind of subordinationism or something like that, you can say uh, Holy Spirit A, Holy Spirit B, Holy Spirit C. Uh, and, and these three are, are one Holy Spirit, or something like this. But why call only one of them the Holy Spirit if they are all Holy Spirits? So the, the best way out of this is to take a Unitarian view and to say that, uh, well, when we speak about the Holy Spirit, we are not talking about a distinct person in divinity. Uh, we are speaking about God's way of acting in the world. And when God acts in the world, Instead of saying God did something, we soften it by saying, you know, the Holy Spirit did, did this and so on. Um, so that could be one application of the use of the term the Holy Spirit. Or it could be some special force that God is giving uh, to Jesus and other creatures to use to, uh, to empower them uh, to do certain good uh, things. So, so there's some vagueness there about the Holy Spirit, but you can't construct a theology based on this kind of uh, vague uh, reference. You have to say, okay, let our theology be built on something that is solid, something that is simple, clear, and declared in, in the Bible. And then we will say we don't know the rest. Uh, but what has happened here is that, uh, you know, things that are not clear has be have become the bedrock of the, of the Christian belief. And we can see how problematic the Trinitarian belief uh, has become among Christians. Okay. Um... Okay, Dean Crossley, good afternoon, Dr. Raleigh. 
In the account of Ananias and Sapphira in uh, or Sapphira in Acts five, where the couple this couple lied about the sale of the land to the early church, we read. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money, uh, kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? Uh, you have not lied just to human beings but to God. It, if, as our Jehovah's Witness uh, friends affirm, the Holy Spirit is simply a force, how can a force be lied to or be blasphemed? Okay, so let me answer this uh, uh, part first and then I'll go to the rest of your uh, comments, Dean. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we say that whoever rejects uh, those whom I send, uh, Jesus says, whoever rejects those whom I send, uh, reject not you, but uh, they, they reject uh, me. So Jesus is sending out his disciples and saying to them, okay, whoever rejects you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And so what does it mean? Does it mean the disciples are Jesus? No, it means that they come out with uh, the authority given uh, by Jesus. And when they are rejected, the rejection comes back to Jesus. They are, in, in by implication, rejecting Jesus. It doesn't mean the disciples are Jesus. So when it says, you know, you lie to the Holy Spirit, it could be because uh, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, Peter is thus, uh, you know, in, in the position where the Holy Spirit is inspiring him, and he is dealing with uh, the uh, other members of the church. The other members of the church, if they're lying to Peter, they are lying to the Spirit that is there with Within Peter as well, and that is guiding Peter. It doesn't mean that Peter is the Spirit, and it doesn't mean that the Spirit uh, is a separate and distinct person from the, the divine uh, uh, essence or from, from, from the Father. Uh, this is just a way of uh, speaking. Whoever denies me, denies uh, whoever denies the one I send is actually denying me, and so on. And there are many other statements to this effect. Uh, actually, this has been amply uh, answered, and I was just reading this this morning. Uh, by um, Hunting and um, who is the other author? His name escapes me at, at, at the moment. Uh, but um, I'll just look it up here because I don't have the book on the table with me. Uh, so um, the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so the doctrine of the Trinity... Um, hmm, I see there's a new book on that uh, question. Okay, it, it looks like it's the same book, but it's been uh, reprinted. Uh, so Anthony Buzzard and uh, Charles Hunting. Um, yeah, it's been reprinted. I was thinking that, you know, this. I have an old copy, and I was thinking that it needs to be uh, reset nicely and, and printed, and I can see it has been uh, uh, reprinted, probably reset as well. Um, yeah, Anthony Buzzard and Charles Hunting. Uh, the Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity, Self-Inflicted uh, Wound. There's a whole chapter dealing with the Holy Spirit there. And uh, you will find in that chapter that um, this particular question has been answered with other references, uh, references in the Bible, uh, showing similarly that if you're lying uh, to this person, you're actually lying to God. It doesn't mean that this person is God. Okay, so we continue. Uh, if, as our Jehovah's uh, so okay, I dealt with that. If the New Testament affirms, if the New Testament affirms that the Holy Spirit has intellect, uh, he speaks in John 16, in Acts 1, and so on, um, in Timothy, Hebrews, uh, Revelation, and so on, uh, and will, uh, and, and he has will, as Acts 15, 28, can one not conclude that those are all the elements of uh, a personal entity? Now, the the uh, the most personal of all of these will be the reference in John's Gospel, where Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks about the paraclete to come after him, whom John's Gospel identifies as the Holy Spirit. But I'll have more to say about this, uh, uh, my friend Dean, uh, when I come to deal with John's Gospel and uh, his uh, mention of the paraclete. Uh, so I'm going to delay answering this part until then. And of course, I didn't deal with Acts of the Apostles yet, uh, systematically, so I'm going to deal with that in the next post. That will be next week, God willing, uh, at the same time, 12.30 p.m. Uh, Sunday afternoon. So join me for that, and uh, we'll explore all of the passages in Acts that deal with the Holy Spirit. 
And um, that will be, I think, an interesting uh, study. It'll be a continuation of what we already found in Luke's Gospel. And then eventually we'll get to Paul and the rest of the New Testament as well. We want to, uh, you know, explore this in great detail. I don't want to miss anything in case uh, it, there is one verse that says that uh, the, the Holy Spirit is uh, the third person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, then, of course, I don't want to miss that verse if there is such a verse. So I want to comb everything. Maybe there isn't a verse with saying so explicitly, but maybe it says something in, in, uh, by implication or a number of verses together. So I want to find all of these verses, put them together, and let's study them together. So do join me next week. We'll look at the Holy Spirit in Acts of the Apostles. So I'll, I'll delay answering that aspect of your question until uh, then. Uh, okay, so you do you do think that, that that would be good for me to ponder for next week. Yeah, okay, so good. Uh, I'm going to, uh, in that case, I'm going to copy this, um, and I'll keep it as my notes uh, for next week. How is that? Um, so let me get a note uh, pad up here and paste that in. Yeah, so I'm ready to look at these references uh, for next week. Okay, so... Uh, Muhammad uh, Inamal uh, Islam, uh, Assalamu alaikum, watching from Bangladesh, wa alaikum assalam, brother Muhammad Inamal, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all of the people of Bangladesh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all and save you from every other, from every sickness and distress and, and, uh, and stress. Okay, and uh, Wahid Omar uh, Nagash, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all of the people around you. Farooq Bagaya, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh, watching from uh, Kharj, uh, Al Kharj in Saudi Arabia, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all the people of Saudi Arabia. You know, that's one of the places I miss coming to um, since the lockdown uh, last year. Um, had it not been for the lockdown, I would have um, come there, inshallah, to perform Hajj and Umrah. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know when those uh, glorious days will come back, my brother. But um, you're lucky being there already. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and all of the people around you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reopen the places of Hajj and Umrah. Uh, in a way that is safe for us and uh, and pleasing to him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us there. Okay, Dennis, you said that the view of Jesus having the Holy Spirit is slightly different from the Quran. What is your view on Quran? So, uh, Surah 2 verse uh, 87, and we gave Jesus, son of Mary, clear proofs and supported him uh, with, the pure, pure, with the pure spirit. That is pretty much the same as the Bible says, at least in view of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit as the power of God, even though it is personified in the Gospel of John and the book, and in the Books, book of Acts. Okay, so uh, the only thing I would say, Dennis, is that uh, there is more in the Bible to, to give you the definitive view uh, that uh, this is a force from God, uh, as opposed to another, let's say, a creature of God. Um, whereas in, in the Quran, we are inclined to think that the Spirit is a creature of God, um, um, and, and in any case, a being that is de dependent and subordinate, uh, dependent on and subordinate to God. And uh, of course, you've heard my um, comments uh, to another um, uh, questioner who, who asked me about specifically this, though he didn't mention the verse a number, but he was asking me about uh, Jesus being supported by the Holy Spirit, and I answered that in some detail. So I won't repeat that now. Um, so Antonio, uh, Dr. Ali, have you read or heard Rabbi Tovia Singer's work on both the Old and New Testament? He has strongly criticized the Trinitarian concept of the Holy Spirit being as an entirely different person within the Triune God, both uh, in the Old and New Testament. Although him being an Orthodox Jew fluent in Hebrew and having a very similar concept of Tawhid, he has more of an issue with this concept being projected onto the Old Testament. He has started, stated that he has strong respect for Islam. Yes, I'm aware of Rabbi Tovia Singer's work, and in fact, um, we've made attempts to connect with each other, and uh, I have to blame myself. I'm the failure at this, at connecting with him, and uh, uh, we should have... Um, a more a discussion between him and more discussions between him and I, not necessarily of a public nature, but even as a, you know, in private correspondence. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, I am uh, the weak link in that um, communication process, but I, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by your uh, comments to get cracking with this and get in touch with uh, Rabbi Singer. But I've read his uh, two volume book, Let's Get, Let's get Biblical. And uh, I have uh, looked briefly at uh, a couple of his uh, videos, or maybe just one video, I have to confess that I don't look at videos that much. And um, 
I, I prefer to read. Uh, that's how I get uh, the little knowledge that I have. Um, and I feel that I gain more from reading than from watching the videos because, you know, in a video you're controlled, you have to watch sequentially and so on. I mean, you can jump back and forth, but sometimes, you, you know, you miss what you wanted and then you have to go back searching for it and so on. Uh, in a book, uh, I can find things more easily and uh, I, I feel more in control of the book and I can read at my own pace and what I want and look up what I need and so on more easily. So uh, people send me links to videos, especially videos of Rabbi uh, Singer. And um, I have to confess that I don't have the, 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 the time to, uh, perhaps even the patience to watch these uh, videos, uh, given my preference for books. I mean, it's not that I'm not interested in the subject or the man himself, uh, but I would rather read his two volume book, Let's Get Biblical, than to look at some of the videos. But yes, he has a lot to, that is interesting to say. And a, a lot of um, uh, experts in the Old Testament will find it appalling that uh, Trinitarians are uh, trying to prove their case with reference to the Old Testament. It's actually uh, far from what uh, the Old Testament is far from what um, the Trinitarians are trying to prove. Okay, Dennis, an interesting verse about the Holy Spirit is Luke eleven thirteen. Therefore, if you, be, though being wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those asking him? Yeah, Dennis, I, I don't know if you um, tuned in late, but uh, I actually mentioned this uh, passage in, um, I think, towards the end of my main presentation. Uh, so um, please, if you want to go back and look over the video uh, with that in mind, uh, you will find that interesting. David, why is it that Allah never calls himself holy? He never says that the Quran is holy. He never said that Muhammad was holy. He never said that Muslims are holy, but he only mentions the Holy Spirit by whom he strengthened uh, Jesus. Well, actually, David, uh, the Quran does actually say that God is Al-Quddus. Uh, that's one of the names of God. Uh, so Al-Malik Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'minul, Muhaymin, and so on. So many names of God. One of them is Al-Quddus. You'll find this in the 59th chapter of the Quran. Uh, the, towards the end. Perhaps it's the last verse. Maybe that's the long verse. I haven't looked at it recently, but the 59th chapter of the Quran. All right. Um, uh, so, so yeah, God is holy as well. But uh, the Quran itself is called by different names. The Quran is called Al-Quran, Al-Majid, the glorious Quran. So epithets, uh, you know, uh, are different depending on what God chose to call uh, which. Um, so, and of course, it doesn't call Jesus uh, holy. It calls Jesus uh, the um, a, a, a pure uh, child. Um, and um, it calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of holiness, spirit of holiness. So there are distinctions there. Why? Um, I don't know if anyone has probed this to any depth, uh, David. If you have a point to make about this, I'll be interested to know what the point is. Uh, but um, I, I will leave it at that for the moment. Corey, also, do you agree with the traditional rules of interpreting the Quran laid out by Imam Shafi and others? Well, you know, uh, Corey, Imam Shafi and others, uh, they each worked in their milieu. They had uh, certain constraints. Uh, they uh, said what they said. We learned from all of them, and uh, we progressed with that knowledge. I mean, what they said is not the be-all and end-all of all knowledge. It uh, might be the beginning of our knowledge. So we respect them as great scholars of our past, uh, but, of course, we advance beyond that. Nowadays, there are many different interpretive tools uh, which were not known to the previous uh, generations of scholars. We have to be honest with ourselves and honest with God and responsible to God uh, in using all of the um, faculties which God has given us, all of the um, tools which God has placed at our disposal in, in understanding uh, what, what God's message is to us. Okay, uh, Bobby, but aren't you giving it a biological spin? A Muslim affirms that Allah um, would uh, sat be and uh, Allah would say be and it is. So because the Holy Spirit is God, he just has to say be. Okay, so I'm not sure what you meant by biological spin. Do you mean when I was speaking about the, um, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary? Um, well, as I said, it's not it's not Muslims who are putting that biological spin. Um, I cited Simon Gathercall. Uh, look at the Oxford uh, Handbook to the Trinity and uh, see Simon Gathercall's um, article in there regarding the uh, Trinity in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, okay, Chris Chase, uh, in Romans 10, 13, Paul uses the term Lord, a term usually reserved for God to describe Jesus Christ. 
Uh, why would Paul do this to describe Jesus Christ? Uh, Paul does this again in Corinthians 131. He refers to Jesus Christ as Lord. Paul seems to be referring to Jesus Christ as God interchangeably and God interchangeably as Lord. Or is Paul simply referring to Jesus Christ as Lord because Jesus uh, is a human vessel with whom we can better approach and understand God uh, simply because Jesus has a, such a strong and intimate relationship to God the Father. So, um, uh, Chris, uh, it, it's it's. Uh, clear that uh, Paul sees Jesus uh, in this role, that he has so such a, clo a close and intimate relationship with God the Father, and that Jesus is the way to approach uh, God the Father. Uh, so why does he use the term uh, Lord um, for, for Jesus? Perhaps specifically this. But did Paul mean that uh, by calling Jesus Lord, Jesus uh, is being designated as God? No, because for Paul, there is only one God, and that one God is the Father, as he explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 6. Jesus is called Lord, uh, but Paul is not calling him God. Paul is calling God the Father. Um, okay, uh, Zahir. Ahmed, the Quran says that if there are verses that are decisive in meaning and there are others that are susceptible to different interpretations, uh, does any uh, of other books... Uh, does any other books have this kind of writing in your knowledge? Why Quran uh, verses are not all decisive in meaning and on which scale would measure if they are decisive or susceptible? Okay, so uh, yes, uh, Zahir, the Quran makes this explicit statement that, that some of its verses are decisive, some of them are, um, uh, you know, um, obscure and, and you would have to go with the decisive verses. Uh, but while the Quran dis, uh, declares this uh, uh, aspect of its um, composition, uh, the other books are approached with the same um, principle in mind as well. When I debated with Nabil Qureshi, he actually um, agreed in principle that there are clear verses and there are unclear verses in the Bible, and uh, the unclear has to be uh, understood in the light of the clear. So this is a, a general principle. With almost anything, I mean, some, depending on who is writing and for what audience and so on, um, they, they're going to write in a way that is, um, you know, appealing to and uh, understandable to their particular audience. I mean, if we're writing a book for children, we're going to write with the, the idea that children are going to read this. It must be at, uh, you know, a simple level so the children can understand. If you're writing a book for both adults and children, well, then... Uh, whom do you write to? If you write to the adults, the children will be lost. If you write to the children, the adults uh, will find this boring. It has to be somewhere in between or a mixture of the two, something to capture the interest and keep, keep the interest of both the adults and the children. Now, the Quran is written not only for adults and children, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, cross-sectioning uh, the population that way, uh, but to uh, all different uh, pe people of many different uh, fields uh, of interest uh, and, and expertise. Uh, so the Quran, uh, to strike this balance and appeal to all of the, uh, these diverse audiences at once, uh, you know, had to um, put things in a way that will be lost to some people, that be obscure to some, but might be uh, penetrable to a certain degree by some others. And maybe uh, some would not be penetrable at all, uh, but is given there with God's own wisdom and, and knowing the psychology of human beings and knowing what is good for them. Uh, so, you know, a child doesn't understand why he has to eat or she has to eat broccoli, uh, but we know it's good for them, so we give them the greens. And the things that don't taste so nice, uh, they would rather eat uh, strawberry shortcake uh, uh, or double chocolate cake. Uh, but uh, we give them what we know is good for them. So what God has in, uh, put in the Quran, all of the ingredients there are good for us, and we do not understand all of it, uh, but we just know that this is good for us. We read the whole thing. It has an impact on our psychology and our minds, and we don't even know what, uh, you know which verse is affecting our minds in which way, uh, but it has its desired effect. So that's a divine influence on us. And God knows best why he put it uh, that way. But uh, all books uh, have, uh, you know, some things that are clear, some things that are not clear. That's why you have things like 
cliff notes and Barnes notes and so on uh, in order to understand the books that you are reading, whether it be the Bible, it be Shakespeare or any other book. Okay, Corey, I think my question may have been skipped. I'm not sure which uh, question that was, Corey. So please uh, uh, copy and, and repaste it towards the end here. I'm, I'm coming down to the end, so I'll look at it when I get there. Okay, Yusuf Ali, uh, salam, watching from Michigan, mashallah. May Allah SWT bless you, brother Yusuf uh, Ali. Uh, I look at your um, profile picture here, and uh, I, I wonder if I, I met you. You know, when I, I mentioned the debate with Nabil Qureshi. That took place at Wayne State University in Michigan. So maybe I met you on that occasion. If not, then may Allah SWT bring us together. May we meet each other, inshallah. Uh, if not in this life, then uh, at least uh, under the shade of his throne on the Day of Judgment, inshallah. Oh, Omid, uh, commenting on my beard style. Thank you, uh, Omid. And uh, Glenn uh, Usher, the uh, 100th name should uh, be al Fadi, uh, Redeemer. Well, it's not for us to decide, um, Glenn. Um, I understand the spirit in which you offer this. I'm, I'm not uh, one to suggest what God's names uh, should be. Um, but nonetheless, I, I appreciate your, your point. But uh, as for God uh, saving people, um, he, is, he is the one that, that saves us uh, in the Islamic uh, tradition. Chris Chase, uh, look at Holy Spirit mentioned by Paul, uh, Romans 1, 1 to 4, and Thessalonians 1, 15. Uh, Paul never specifically calls out the Holy Spirit as a separate person, seems to refer to it as God's holy presence with Jesus and us on earth. Okay, Chris, that's uh, interesting that you're mentioning this because it's giving me more of an insight uh, into you. Um, I mean, to understand your, your viewpoint. Uh, we met briefly some years ago when we had that uh, dialogue together. And um, I believe you're the same Chris Chase. Uh, yes, uh, I can see a profile picture here. And um, uh, Chris, uh, I, um, I appreciate your thoughts. It seems that... Um, that you're not a Trinitarian then, um, if, I can, if, I, if I'm reading you correctly. And uh, that, that's interesting. So I'm going to look uh, more uh, closely at, uh, at these passages uh, as, as we progress with this series of studies. Okay, so Glenn Usher uh, telling us it's Surah 57, verse number 27. Thank you. Thank you for that, Glenn. Uh, Surah 57. Oh, you're asking me to look at that. I thought you were uh, mentioning a verse which I previously mentioned. Let me look at that then. Surah 57, uh, 57, 27. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, in, uh, we have here... Um, وَقَفَيْنَا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ بِرُسُلُنَا وَقَفَيْنَا بِإِسْلَمْ لِمَرْيَمَ وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْإِنْجِيلُ وَجَعَلْنَا فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُ رَأْفَةً وَرَحْمَةً وَرَفَانِيَةً نِبْتَدَعُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ رِدْوَانِ اللَّهِ فَمَا رَعَوْهَا حَقَّ رِعَيَتِهَا فَمَا فَآتَيْنَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ Okay, so this speaks very highly of, uh, of Christians, uh, uh, and in, in the translation here it reads, and then we sent, uh, following their footsteps, uh, our messengers, and followed them with Jesus, the son of Mary, and gave him the gospel, and we placed on the hearts of those who followed him compassion and mercy and, uh, and monasticism, which they innovated. We did not uh, prescribe it for them, except that they did so seeking the approval of Allah, but they did not observe it with true observance, so we gave the ones who believed among them their reward, but many of them are defiantly disobedient. Thank you. Uh, for um, drawing our attention to that uh, verse. Uh, Glenn, if there's a particular point you wanted to make about it, then let me know. Glenn, I see you have mentioned a number of other verses here. Uh, time does not permit me, my friend, to go and look at each one of them as I've done for the first one. Um, so please uh, do excuse me for that. Mohammed Ishtiak Majumer, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam. Uh, and uh, I can see you writing here in a foreign language. Uh, may Allah SWT bless you and all of the people of your country and who speak your language. Um, and you say Islam is the only true religion. Thank you. I agree with that. And I think many of uh, those who have joined me will agree. Zahir Ahmad, the spermicide of uh, Jesus uh, could be the part of his mother's own body. Uh, you, you don't mean spermicide. A spermicide will kill sperms. Um, anyway, um, it could be part of his mother's own body because uh, for Allah, everything 
uh, possible, and even in, in not uh, non-proven science, the standard is obvious, uh, come before outrageous. So, um, Zahir, I'm so sorry, my friend, that, uh, you know, some parts of your question, I, I, I'm not so uh, I'm quick to understand, uh, partly because of, uh, you know, it seems to me that English is your second language, but do forgive me. Perhaps it is your first and you're using it at a high level and I don't, just don't understand. But nonetheless, uh, you're, I, I think the thrust of your question is to, or your statement is to say uh, that um, uh, the, 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 the sperm uh, that formed Jesus could have come from his mother. And this is uh, possible, even if it is not proven in, in science. Um, so, okay. I mean, that's... Uh, um, one who says, one who says that this is a miracle from God, God caused Jesus to be born from Mary alone without the intervention of a human father. One would say that uh, God is the creator of Jesus in the womb of his mother Mary. That's it, period. It, there's no need for a scientific explanation. If one is uh, looking for a scientific explanation, one of the first things that one would want to consider is the Y chromosome. See, Y chromosomes are passed on only from father to son. Uh, never from mother to son. The mitochondrial DNA is passed on from uh, a mother to her children, uh, but uh, the Y chromosome has to come from a father. So for, for, for Jesus to be male, he has to have Y chromosomes, and uh, the Y chromosome has to come from his father, his human father. Well, I mean, if you're tracing it scientifically. If you say that God created the Y chromosome in the womb of his mother, that's fine, but we're not going to find a scientific explanation for that. Um, and uh, if we are looking for the scientific explanation, well, then uh, one has to deal with the Y chromosome. So many years ago, I debated with uh, a Christian representative uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, I believe he's from Australia, but he was uh, maybe studying or working in the United Kingdom at the time, and we had a debate there. And um, what is his name? Uh, Saunders. Saunders is his last name. I don't remember his first name. Uh, but he wrote a, uh, a pamphlet entitled, uh, But Wasn't Jesus a Muslim? And in that pamphlet, and also in the, I think he mentioned it in the debate with me as well, or I brought it up. But in any case, in the pamphlet for sure, uh, he suggested that God created the Y chromosome um, that formed Jesus. So, you know, that, that, so one who's looking for a scientific explanation would want to contend with that, uh, Brother uh, Zahir. Okay, Glenn Osher, Usher is saying context. I agree with that. We always have to look at context. Salih, uh, Mehmet Toglu. Uh, some people simply do anything in order not to accept the truth. In case uh, of that, you found out that uh, Dr. Shabir was right. Uh, would you convert and become Muslim? Uh, the answer would be no. In Al-Quran, there is a verse that mentions people of this type asking questions uh, uh, to the prophets, Noah, Moses, uh, and uh, Muhammad, peace be upon them. And in the end, they simply said, I don't believe you. They told our prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, that if you could uh, split the moon in two parts, then we might be able to believe in you. Uh, after some praying to Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, did split the moon into two equal halves. What happened next? They said, we still don't uh, believe you. So you are right in that part uh, in saying, Brother Saleh, that uh, people are like this, you know, they will ask questions and then they, they will not uh, believe in the end. Uh, it, it may be interesting for you to uh, explore a little bit further this incident about the splitting of the moon and to recognize that there are different views about that uh, question, but I'm going to leave that alone for the moment because it's a little off topic, but your, uh, your uh, recognition that people are like this, uh, this is... Um, Interesting. I see Muhammad Ishtiak uh, speaking of parthenogenesis. Uh, that's an interesting concept, uh, but you know, which um, suggests that uh, a, um, a a human baby may be born uh, from the mother alone. Now, parthenogenesis uh, has not been known to occur among human beings, and in general, our presupposition is that it does not occur. Um, and so I'm not denying that Jesus was born of a virgin, as many Muslims, uh, most Muslims believe. Uh, but uh, you, some of you may be interested to find some of my old videos in which I've uh, dealt with this question. And I've tried to distinguish between what the Quran actually says on the question and what Muslims have come to believe. So Muslims generally believe that Jesus was conceived uh, of a virgin. Um, 
uh, was conceived of by a virgin, was conceived by a virgin, uh, that Mary was a virgin at the time when she conceived uh, of Jesus. Uh, uh, but uh, that is not specifically and outrightly said in the Quran itself. One might form an inference from that. One might see that even as an implication from what the Quran says, but it's not so clear in the Quran it, itself. Uh, so um, if we're looking for parthenogenesis, uh, then you know it's not known to occur among human beings. And um, in our presumption is that it does not occur. You know, if a teenage girl comes home and says, you know, Dad, I'm a little bit pregnant, uh, the dad uh, is going to be curious, okay, who did this? And if she says, you know, the Holy Spirit did it, uh, the father is not going to be very um, uh, open to believing that. Uh, he, he might be uh, rightfully skeptical about how, how his daughter became pregnant. <clears throat> so it's not, a, it's not a presumption that that uh, you know this parthenogenesis will occur or that God just simply did it uh, with, uh, with a female. Now if, if it happened, if this was a one-off uh, occasion as uh, Imam al-Razi says in his tafsir, uh, but uh, if one is looking for the scientific explanation again, you know parthenogenesis does not seem uh, to be a suitable uh, scientific explanation. The most you can, you can say uh, by this is that seeing that it occurs in other animals uh, then it's not beyond the power of God to make it happen for a human being, at least in one uh, case. I mean, God can make it happen in every case, but if to say that God made it happen in one case, it's not impossible. Nothing is impossible for God. We agree with that. Okay, David Silent, uh, Surah 59, verse 23. He is Allah. There is no God except him, the king, uh, the most holy. Uh, the, and so there is the most holy. Thank you, David, uh, for that. And... Um, my point is Allah himself never said that he is holy, but the words here are from someone else uh, than Allah. Well, David, from the Muslim point of view, the entire Quran is, um, you know, a, a speech from Allah. There, there are sections which, um, you know, seem to be the other way around. Like, for example, the beginning uh, uh, chapter of the Quran is an address from Muslims uh, to God and so on. Uh, and there are many other passages throughout the Quran. But uh, uh, the like the main presumption is that the Quran is the speech of God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So even when the Quran is speaking of God in the third person, uh, often this is God uh, speaking of himself, but he uses the third person for his own good uh, um, uh, reasons. And some of these reasons are explored in a, in a very important book entitled Discovering the Quran by Neil uh, Robinson. Okay, Glenn Usher, Compassion and Mercy uh, in the Heart from Jesus. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And um, uh, the Quran acknowledges that compassion and mercy is there uh, among Christians, and God has placed this compassion and mercy in them. Fatima Sultana, Salaamu Alaikum, Sir Fatima from India, MashaAllah, may Allah SWT bless you and protect you and all of the people of India. Sir, how to answer if uh, asked why Jesus were given more mercy, um, um, more miracles than any other prophet. Uh, why prophet uh, was not given any except Quran? If only he, Jesus, was a, a God or son of God. <clears throat> There's something interesting I was reading the other day because now I'm studying uh, the Greek language. So I'm starting to read the <clears throat> New Testament, at least some portions in Greek, or at least I'm uh, not, not trying to read it directly, but looking at uh, the, the Greek words after having looked at the translation. Um, and uh, there is this one passage where Jesus is speaking to the people and the people are crowding him so much that he went out uh, on a boat on, in, in, into the lake. So there he sat in the boat and, and he was addressing the people who were still on shore, uh, on the shore. But uh, the, the Bible says that he sat in the lake, in the lake. Um, obviously, we know he sat in the boat, which was in the lake. But it's interesting that the Bible put it that way, that he sat in the lake. So uh, what I mean to, uh, by, by drawing reference to this is that, um, you know, sometimes we have to uh, think about the way things are stated and, uh, and the level of proof that goes with a certain a statement about a miracle. So Jesus walked on water, but somebody may be wondering, okay, well, you know, um, what was underneath the water? Was he walking on rocks? Somebody, some, somebody may wonder about that today. And of course, we, we don't have the ability to go back and check. I'm not saying that Muslims should have this skeptical attitude regarding Jesus and whom be peace. The Quran shows that Jesus performed many miracles. And based on the Quran alone, Muslims believe that Jesus performed uh, miracles. Uh, but one who is skeptical, 
one who is neither a Muslim nor a Christian, or even some Christians are going to be skeptical about the stories of the miracles of Jesus, and they're going to wonder, you know, was this really a miracle, or was there an explanation which was not given? So take the uh, parting of the Red Sea for Moses and his people to cross. You know, there are people who explain this by saying maybe there was a strong wind that blew back the waters, uh, maybe there was a low tide and um, the waters receded, and so Moses knew exactly the time to cross on the dry land, and then eventually the waters came back as would normally happen, uh, you know, when the tides change. And uh, the Pharaoh and his people did not understand this. That's why they drowned. And when this whole story was recounted, it was recounted uh, with a miraculous flavor to it, giving the impression that, uh, you know, this was a violation of the laws of nature. But some would want to explain some events without any laws of nature being violated. In other words, uh, in conclusion, some people would say that what is mentioned as miracles maybe were not uh, miracles. There might be some scientific explanation uh, behind these uh, events which were not known to the people of the time. They called it miracles and they, they drummed it up and, and um, polished it to make it look like divine intervention, but this was just ordinary science at uh, play which was not fully understood at the time. So in other words so then, and in conclusion, some people today, looking at these miracles, would not find them as a uh, reason for belief. And um, the Quran, on the other hand, uh, Sister Fatima, uh, has been uh, uh, revealed as its miracle itself. So whereas the previous prophets were performing miracles and drawing the people's attention by saying, look, I'm performing this miracle that proves I'm, or God, is, God is with me, and so listen to my message. Now, in the case of the Quran, the Quran is its own miracle. So the Quran is, uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, does not have to say, look, I'm performing this other miracle, so look at that miracle and believe in my message. Uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is made to say, look, the Quran is my miracle. So, and that is my message as well. So as long as you have the message, you'll have the miracle along with it. So you don't have to look back to something in the past to, um, to think about whether or not we can accept this as true. Uh, you think about something that is present here in your hands and ask yourself whether you can accept that is true. Um, so, um, Glenn Asher, Surah 57, verse 27, only Jesus can imbue our heart with his gospel and compassion and mercy. I don't think it means that, Glenn. Um, it, you know, I read it previously, and it says, uh, God is speaking. Uh, we have placed in the hearts of those who followed him uh, mercy and uh, and, and compassion. So God has placed the compassion and mercy in the hearts of the Christians. Uh, Chris Chase, yes, I am a Unitarian Christian, or specifically a biblical Unitarian. Grew up as a Roman Catholic, but have had problem with uh, had a problem with the Trinity as early as 12 years old. I created my own Jefferson Bible before I ever knew Th President Thomas Jefferson did uh, that did the same thing. Okay, thank you, Ch uh, Chris. Uh, that's interesting. I, I I didn't know that. You see that I didn't do my homework, my friend. Um, it, maybe I said some things in my dialogue with you which were not appropriate. Maybe I addressed you as though you were a Trinitarian, and that wouldn't have been fair. So forgive me if I misunderstood you in the past. I have a better understanding now, and I'm glad that we're still friends. Okay, Glenn, uh, Jesus came from the Holy Spirit in uh, Mary's womb. Okay, so we dealt with that, Glenn. And again from Glenn, uh, Mary is the only lady mentioned by name in the Quran uh, because Jesus is uh, Messiah to save people from their sins. Well, uh, uh, Mary is prominently mentioned in the Quran. Um, he, he, is she the only person that's mentioned by name? You see, Glenn, I don't even know my Quran that, that well, and you're teaching me something here. Maybe you're right. Maybe Mary is the only woman who is mentioned by name in, in the Quran. I'm going to look that up right away. I'm so curious about that. Uh, is Mary uh, the only woman in the Quran? I mean, mentioned by name, obviously. I mean, there's Balqis and so on who are mentioned. She's the only woman who's been mentioned in the Quran. Yeah, Islamic finder. I interesting. Glenn, you just taught me something there. Thank you for that, my friend. Okay, but but the, her, the fact that she's the only woman mentioned in the Quran, that doesn't mean that the Quran is accepting that the reason for that is because uh, he will save his people from their sins. Except, if you mean... Uh, that, uh, you know, saving the people from their sins, this could be understood in a general way. That Jesus, uh, along with other prophets, they come with a saving message. If people accept the message, they are saved uh, from their sins. Not from the idea, point of view that Jesus died for the sins of humankind. Um, so, um, let me finish up with the last two comments here, and then uh, I'll have to go. Sorry about that. Okay, Hassan... Uh, uh, 
double. Um, Assalamu alaikum, my brother, my wife was pregnant during month of Ramadan. She did not fast for the past Ramadan. She is breastfeeding my daughter. Should I fast on her behalf uh, for the next Ramadan? If yes, I want to fast for her. Barakallahu fikum. Uh, no, my brother, you shouldn't fast on her behalf, but uh, you should give a charity if you can afford. Give a charity for one uh, 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 for each day of the fast. Give one meal for one poor person. So if you, she missed 30 days of fast, then she would uh, uh, feed one poor person for each day of, of the fast. Uh, um, so you can work that out, whatever is the cost of uh, a meal in your, in your situation. Okay, and Glenn Osher, uh, Jesus is the greatest miracle, our, uh, our Al-Fadi Redeemer, Isaiah, and so on. Okay, so maybe Glenn, on another occasion, I'll talk about the idea of Jesus uh, saving people in the way in which uh, Christians uh, feel that he did. I, I did this sometime in the past, and maybe you'll find a video of mine dealing with that. Uh, but in any case, it's a subject that is worth uh, returning to, and eventually I will. But let me finish with this whole series on the Holy Spirit. So next week, God willing, I'll talk about the Holy Spirit in Acts of the Apostles. So do, do join me for that, 12.30 p.m., Saturday afternoon, uh, Sunday, Sunday afternoon, Toronto time. In the meantime, please support the humble work we do for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, please go to our website. The organization's website is www.islaminfo.com. Islaminfo.com. That's where you can send me a question. You can send a donation. And it's a donation that I'm requesting at this moment. Please uh, donate to help us continue the good work that we're doing for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal so that the message of Islam can reach around uh, the globe. Please uh, uh, join me in praying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept uh, our humble efforts today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. If I said anything wrong, that is from me. And we ask Allah to forgive me. And uh, may Allah erase from our minds anything that was said wrong or done wrong. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erase from our records any sin against us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us among his righteous servants and uh, cause us to live in a way that is pleasing to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive, not deprive us of his love, but rather grant us his love. May Allah grant us his protection and his mercy, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the entire world. If we have just entered into a new year, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring uh, all of the good of this new year to the entire world to make this a year of uh, immunization in which we are all protected from the COVID-19 and from every other disease and stress and distress. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and the entire world. May Allah protect the environment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta grant uh, his uh, love and mercy uh, to all human beings so that we live in harmony and in mutual tolerance and respect. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our world a safe place, uh, a place that we will be happy to uh, hand over to our children and to our grandchildren. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. Thank you all for watching. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you next week. Inshallah.